Okay, how's the lighting? Is it too much or is it all right? Lighting okay? Let's do this this way. Uh huh. You know, I'm like amazing myself. Every time I see myself, I just get better looking. What's up? By the way, Protestant, you here, brother? Protestant, is my brother here from different mother? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just like getting better looking every day. You, you guys, your prayers are working for me. Protestant, here's what I want to do. I want to do a, a session on who do we pray to according to the Bible, but then I want to transition into how Muhammad proves Jesus is God because it's a related topic. The topic is related. The topic is related in that I'm going to talk about what the Bible says about who do we pray to, Lord Jesus willing by the power of the Holy Spirit, because I'm going to pray first, and hopefully the modem. What happened to the modem? Man? Anyway, I hope the modem stays strong. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. All right. Hopefully everything's good. I had the Wi-Fi on. I just turned it off, but it's okay. Anyway, hopefully the modem is warmed up and it'll stay strong, the connection. I just turned off the Wi-Fi. You guys can still hear me, right? Okay. So what I want to do is two topics, God willing. I want to finish one topic. Who do we pray to according to God's word, the Holy Bible? And then transition into part two of Muhammad proves Jesus is God because it's related. I'm going to show what Muhammad said about praying and how this again proves that Jesus Christ claimed to be God and his followers worshipped him as God. Does everyone understand what I, what I want to accomplish? Louisa, good to see you, sister. Lord Jesus, bless every one of you. I want to do two sessions. Okay, let me explain what I want to do. This session will be, who do we pray to according to the Holy Bible? God's word, the Holy Bible, who do we pray to when we pray? The Father in Jesus' name, by the Spirit. Or we can pray to the Son as well. And can we pray to the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name? But I'm going to begin in prayer in a moment. Then I want to transition into discussing how Muhammad again proves Jesus claimed to be God and must be God because of what Muhammad said about prayer. But I can either do it one session and then Protestant can then split it up into two. Or I can finish this session and right away start another live stream. What do you think it's most ideal? Just continue instead of stopping and starting. Because sometimes when I stop and start, people don't come. So we just keep it one session? Okay, we'll keep it one session, but then Protestant, do you have the ability to then split it in two? Because I'll tell you, okay, Protestant, this is the cut point. So when you edit it, okay, so then we'll do that. We'll make it one session, and then I'll say, okay, Protestant, this session ends. Second session begins. Muhammad proves Jesus is God, part two. Okay, so we'll do that. Momo, please be on bottom, yeah. yeah that's, that's weird. You call them Momo. Where'd you get that from? I don't hear many people calling Muhammad Momo. Actually, in my circle of friends, we call him Momo. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. Do I know you, man, Captain Bloodfire? Like, are you like an undercover brother from a different mother that I know from the hood? It's all good if you're from the hood. I don't know what dark matter means, man. All right, anyway. It's all good if you're from the hood. And if you're my brother from a different mother like no other. You know what I'm saying? Because we say Momo. Yeah, because he said Momo. I don't hear many people use the term Momo, but in my circle of friends, we call him Momo. And there's a reason why my friends call him Momo, because it sounds like, what does it sound like? You know, yesterday, I'm going to pray. Begin pray. <laughs> yesterday, I watched the video, right? But honestly, glory to Jesus Christ. He's helped me lose weight. Pray that he helps me lose all of that weight I want to lose, get my health for his glory, not to use it for vanity in Jesus' name. Right. Um, you know, keep it off, get healthier for his glory, to use my health for his glory for my daughters. But, man, I got to admit, man, the more I look at myself, the more I can't help see how handsome I've been, I'm, I'm becoming, man. It's like I'm one gorgeous beast, a Syrian beast. I'm telling you, I, I was just looking at myself. I was going to ask myself out. Hey, man, are you dating anybody? If not, would you go out with me? But I forgot. That you know, it's you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? All right. Okay. All right. Whatever. Rebecca, how you doing, sister? Good to see you. No. All right. With that said, 
By the grace and mercy of the Chaim God, I hope it will be a blessed session because we're going to talk about who to pray to. Do we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, trusting the Holy Spirit to teach us how to pray, to empower us to pray and give us the grace, the discipline to pray, right? <clears throat> Training us how to pray, teaching us how to pray, and then giving us the grace and the discipline to pray. And when we pray to the Father, we always ask for the sake of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, meaning for the sake of Jesus, <clears throat> because of Jesus, Father, what he's done for us, his merits, make our prayer acceptable to you. Or can we pray to all three persons of the Godhead? Are you ready? And then we're going to transition into, again, Muhammad ends up proving Jesus is God. Thank you, Muhammad. Everyone ready? But I need you to help me so I can help you. First of all, no side tangents, no side discussions. Focus. Please keep questions relevant to the topic because, again, let me explain. I've explained in the past. I'm going to explain it again. I read your comments. And let me tell you why I read your comments. Remy, is that a guy or a girl's name? All this time I thought, Remy, okay. Anyway, let me tell you why I read your comments. I read your comments to see if you're getting the point. Because as a teacher, I want to be used of the Holy Spirit for you to understand. I want you to understand the depth of the Bible by the grace of God's Spirit so that when you understand it, you absorb it, make it second nature, live it out for the glory of Jesus, and teach others. So that's why I read your comments. And I'm, a, I'm not like Christian Prince or David Wood that does not get discombobulated when someone goes off topic or talks about something because, again, as David has said, Hater Wood, who I've been carrying all my life, I do have mental issues. I, I really believe that. And the reason I say that is because every one of us, we are affected by the fall. We are affected by our upbringing. We are affected by our sinful nature and things that we've experienced in this world, <clears throat> things that Satan has orchestrated to destroy us and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to listen to this. The work of the Holy Spirit is to purify us, transform us, <clears throat> wash us of all the damage, all the imperfection, all the filth, all the impurities that we have been exposed to since we were young up until the present to make us whole and heal us to become like Jesus Christ and Jesus' humanity, the way Jesus <clears throat> lived for God on earth, a perfect human life, a sinless human life offered to the Father. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, he is sent by the Father and the Son to wash our minds, purify our minds, cleanse our minds of all the filth that we've seen, all the damage that we've undergone because of either broken homes, parents who didn't know how to raise children because they too were broken and raised by parents who didn't know how to raise them and and things we've seen on television things we've we've seen in school or with our friends everything that Satan has thrown against us to destroy us to damage us right to dehumanize us and make us feel worthless helpless and hopeless the holy spirit comes and applies the saving benefits of Jesus Christ, because by his righteousness, by the blood of Jesus, we are made whole. We are cleansed. We are purified. We are washed. We are transformed. We are restored mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And God bless you guys for your super chat donations. The Lord Jesus bless you. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? But he does it daily, and he does it gradually until either Christ comes down and transforms us in a twinkling of an eye, and there now we are completely perfect, or we die and we shed this body and enter Jesus's heavenly presence as disembodied spirits, spirits, souls without a body. We're now in his presence. We are now completely whole, and then we'll return with him. He will raise our bodies and reconstruct them to become indestructible, right? Is that clear? I hope I didn't confuse you, right? Everyone's fo focusing, paying attention. So help me to help you focus. No side talks, no debates, no flirting with sisters. We had a dog here, a dog of the devil, trying to flirt with one of our sisters, disrespecting, dishonoring her as if she's some, some immoral woman in the street, treating her like she's, she's a dog. When she's a princess, a queen, purchased by Jesus, washed in his blood, transformed by the Spirit to shine for Jesus because she's Jesus' princess. 
And I want to say that to you sisters. I'm going to say that again. You sisters who profess to love Jesus Christ. Let me speak from my heart. We're all fallen sinners and we struggle with sinful passions. But our prayer is, Holy Spirit, destroy our sinful passions. Crucify our flesh and give us life and power to overcome the flesh and walk in holiness and purity and love and devotion to Jesus. Let me share some with you, sisters. This is from my heart. Let me share some with you. You are queens destined to rule with Jesus Christ. Listen, sisters, this is for you. Jesus Christ redeemed you, redeemed your bodies, redeemed your minds, redeemed your hearts for his glory. And the last thing that Jesus wants is for a man to dishonor and abuse and misuse you as some piece of meat. You are more than that. You are queens destined to reign with Jesus Christ. Okay, that means you don't shortchange yourself. You don't allow any man, even if he professes to be a Christian, even me, especially Hater Wood. No, but I'm kidding with David Wood. He's got a godly wife. He's gonna. You don't let any, let any man dishonor you. Dishonor you. You don't let any man talk to you as if you're cheap. And don't get me wrong. I'm not putting down the women in the world, right, who are sexually promiscuous. They, too, need Jesus. They, too, have been damaged. And they, too, are doing what they do because of the destruction that Satan has inflicted on them, whether from childhood or something that happened to them along the, way, along the way. But Jesus desires to restore them and bring them to himself and transform them and wash them in his blood. So let me share this again. You sisters, do not allow, exactly, Captain Bloodfire, do not allow any man to speak to you in a disrespectful manner because I got two daughters. Jesus is my love in my life. And then on earth, I love my daughters the most. I will not allow any man to talk to my daughters in that manner because either he'll end up in a coma and I'll end up in jail or something's going to happen. And may God save me from myself and save my children. You guys are daughters of the living God. You are sisters of Jesus Christ. Destined to be queens to rule with him. Now, you want me to show you where the Bible says you're destined to rule with him? You are royalty. Let me say it again. Let me repeat it again. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, it sinks in your hearts. You are royalty. You are queens. If you are born of the Spirit and the blood of Jesus has covered you, if you are in union with Jesus Christ and you believe in Jesus Christ, born of the Spirit, you are queens, and your father owns the universe, and your father has destined you to sit with his son on thrones, ruling creation. Don't cheapen yourself for any man, and do not let any man use your body for sexual gratification. If that man loves you, he'll wait till he gets married, and that will be your gift to him. Okay. Now, can I show you that you're destined to reign with Christ? Can I show you that? That you are destined to reign with Jesus. Can I show you those verses? Okay. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. 5 to 6. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, wash my mouth in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. And after this, we'll begin in prayer. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Verses 5 to 6. Watch here. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests, made all believers who love him, made all believers that believe in him, a kingdom, kings and priests, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Did you catch it? You are kings and queens whom Jesus is in love with if you're washed by his blood and you will reign with him. That's what it said right there. I don't know what mop is. Captain Blood and Fire, I'm, the, I'm really suspicious about you. I think I'm going to end up blocking you because there's something about your spirit, your attitude is just nasty, the way I see the way you talk. I hope I'm wrong. 
because it takes a lot for David to block someone. It takes me a nanosecond to block someone. I don't have the patience of David. Because only someone stupid would mention Muhammad when I'm talking about the dignity and value that Christians have in Jesus Christ. Yeah, get this guy out of here. This this dog. You, you just exposed yourself. You are a wicked dog. No wonder David muzzled you. Get him out of here. See? Yeah. I block people for a nanosecond. I have serious issues. They're not as bad as David. David's got serious issues. And only Jesus can heal him. And glory to God. He belongs to Jesus and Jesus will heal him. There's no one with the issues that David has. He's a dictator, sociopath, right? And you got to bow to his demands, right? But my issue is I, I block people in a nanosecond. But for David to block someone, you know there's got to be something wrong with, with this dog. But anyway, now let's focus in Jesus' name. Yeah, because he said David blocked him. You know there's something serious about this dog, that he's a rabid dog using the devil to try to distract and divide and rob people of focusing on the beauty of Jesus. Now, for my sisters again, for my sisters, Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. See, even under a shock. Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Pay attention now. Okay. Yeah, and Sophia, well, Sophia films. That's I thought you were Sophia. Okay. Let's why I'm going to say this. We're going to begin in prayer. We're going to begin the discussion. The discussion is not this, but I felt compelled because some dog earlier came to disrespect my sister Hafsa, who now loves Jesus Christ and is born of the Spirit. Oh, you look like a model. My bad. You're pretty. A filthy dog. That's how you talk to your sister? Like some street, street trash thug in the streets, like a game banger? Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Because I used to be in the streets. I know how it is. My bad, girl. You're so cute. Mm, man, you fine. Hey, you got any fries with that shake? I'm dating myself, right? Yeah. Send. See? Tell me this guy's not of the devil, this demon. He comes under another nick. Captain Bloodfire. Get him out of here. See? See the filthy dog? He exposed himself and his mother. Relation 5, 9 to 10. Read with me. And they sung a new song, sa song saying, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood and of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, now, because this dog wasn't educated because he's born from a dog, he said, kings, ha, 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 priest. He doesn't understand that in the Bible... These terms are inclusive, not exclusive. In other words, when the Bible says sons of God, that is an inclusive term to mean any human being, male or female, who believes in Jesus and is born of the Spirit. So when the Bible says kings and pre priests, these are terms that are inclusive, not exclusive. It means all believers whom the Lamb has redeemed by his blood are destined to serve God as priests and priestesses and rule with him. Now, for me to even explain it, that tells you what kind of wicked dog of the devil is he is. All right? Sorry, guys. You guys can get angry with me. you got someone here making fun and blaspheming. I'm going to insult him, right, because he's not born of human. A dog. And again, i got to apologize to dogs. I know on the Day of Judgment, the dogs will be standing there looking at me in anger, and they're going to be wondering why I insulted people by describing people like dogs because there's a lot of dogs. They're a man's best friend. A woman's nightmare, but a man's best friend. And they are loyal to the end. So I apologize to the honestly, I do. I don't know what else to what other term to use. Dogs are loyal till the end. In fact, many times dogs turn out to be more faithful than human beings. So I don't mean to insult dogs. And on the day of judgment, I know I'm gonna have to apologize. Say I, I do apologize. Hey, you know, hey, uh, hey Butch, right? Toby, Marley, I apologize, guys. I know you're better than, say, I was about to say, better than these dogs. In fact, you're more human than them. How about this? You're you're more human. They're the dogs. Can, all right, thank you. All right. Sparky, yeah. You guys know I said Marley, right? You guys understand why I mentioned Marley? That dog with the, the titled Marley, right? Anyway, so women, I can give you more. I can give you more verses. But you see that in Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
You are queens, right? Women, those of you who say, I love Jesus, I'm born of the Spirit, I belong to Christ. You see your destiny in Christ is you are queens who will rule with Christ forever, right? Right? You're queens, right? Do you believe the Bible? If you believe that, then why would you let men dishonor you? Why would you let men talk down to you? Why would you let men use your body for their sexual perverted passions? Why don't you, why don't you see your value in Christ and preserve yourself for that man that God has brought into your life who is a king, washed in the blood of Jesus, born of the same spirit, so that you can then honor that man by becoming one with him in intimate union. But it has to be a fellow believer. Now, look at Hater Wood. Great is the reward of his wife. You understand, by marrying such a man, she doesn't have a mansion. She has thousands of mansions for the sacrifice. In fact, he makes a strong case that believers have to go through purgatory because ever since his wife married him, she has been in purgatory and praying for the day that she can come out of purgatory and dwell in the presence of Christ. Great is that woman's reward for marrying this guy. Lord Jesus bless Marie Wood. Okay, but anyway, you got it, right? Another thing I want to encourage my sisters. I want to say something for my sisters. And I said this, and this was God's orchestrating it. Had I not paid attention to the comment section, someone was hitting on my precious sister in the Lord Jesus, right? I want to discuss this. Another thing I need to encourage my sisters in Jesus Christ. You never unite. You never attach. You never consider marriage with anyone who is not a blood-bought, spirit-filled slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you do what is called missionary dating. Yeah, but you say he's cute, and, you know, we read the Bible together, and I know if I just go out with him and just love on him, he's going to be a Christian. He go, we No, no, that doesn't work. There is no such thing as missionary dating. Okay? Your eyes must be upon godly men, and this applies to, the, to men as well. He must be someone who loves Jesus Christ and not a wolf in sheep's clothing, pretending he does, who's trying to walk in union with Jesus Christ, seeking the Holy Spirit's face, and trying to glorify Christ in the way he lives. That's the only man you unite yourself with. Now, you want me to give you a verse that applies to that? Who you should be yoked with and who you shouldn't be yoked with? You want me to give you a verse for that? 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. Let's begin. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. Look at Joanna. She's praying for a godly tall Christian. How tall? What? 6'8? Hulk Hogan? Now I have to do that, Brother David Julius, because I do see sisters who profess faith in Christ falling for men who are not of the faith, doing missionary dating because they're bad boys. Because you know, look, let's let's put it out there. There are sisters who think they can control and tame a bad boy. So it's a challenge. Ooh, what a bad boy. I can tame him. The 10,000 women that he's been with, that he slept with, that he committed sexual fornication, they didn't have what I got. I can tame this man, and I'll tame him for Jesus. Right? <laughs> Look at Haterwood taking shots at me, bro. Look at this dude, man. Look at Haterwood. Hey, Haterwood, why don't you send me some of your 500 viewers so they can hear some real theology? And why don't you send me like a super chat? Send me about a thousand bucks. You can afford it. And look, he calls me Sham. Sham Shamoon, be like, you ladies must only choose a godly man like me as someone who spends all this time insulting people and hating dogs. Hey, extra sad! Right? But you sisters know what I'm talking about, right? You sisters know what I'm talking about? Come on, sisters. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I, I, I've been there. I've done that, Sam. I thought it's real hot looking model. He had a six pack. And I said, yeah, if Jesus wants me to preach to him. Jesus wants me to save him. Yeah, team that bad boy. Yeah, let me lay hands on you. Right? Come on, sisters. You know you've been there. You've done it. Right? Been there, done that? 
Can I get an amen? <laughs> Damn, that man's so hot. I need to cool him off. Yeah, yes, because that, 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 that's the heat of the, of the flames of hell. I need to be saying, come on, son. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. Can I get an email? Can I get a witness? Come on, sister. You don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, did you pay attention, by the way? None of the sisters said amen. Right? Do you know why? Because they didn't want to expose themselves. Because if they said amen, oops, now they know I was one of those sisters. You see? None of them said amen. Did you catch it? Oh, sister, you're okay. I don't see it. The sisters didn't say no. They went silent. No, not me. I've always been a good girl. When I was growing up with mommy, I was one of those, you know, like choir girls. I sang in the choir. I didn't mean never no. I never went out with anybody. <laughs> okay. Now let's let's read 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. Let's get back. All right. Yep. Let's read that. Okay. Let's do it again. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. Uh-huh, Sophia. Why you why you why? Okay, now pay attention to this. But ye be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Okay. And what communion hath light with darkness? Not about fellowship. <clears throat> you revolve your life around these individuals, right? You enter into intimate communion and, and intimacy and fellowship with not unbelievers. You know what it says? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Now notice what 16, 18 says. This is God's promise to you, men and women, if you honor Jesus Christ in your communion and fellowship and intimate relationships. Do it his way, he'll bless you. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. I, God the Father, will live in you, in your hearts, in your homes, and watch over you and bless you, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now notice 17, 18. Notice 17, 18. Wow, man. Hater Woods gave me $50. Now watch. He's going to take it back right after the live stream. Sucker, that was just for show. All right. 17, 18. Wherefore, come out from among them. Guys, pay attention to what God says to you, sisters, and to you, brothers. Come out from among them. Don't live in the world. Don't engage in the activities of the world. Don't have fellowship with worldly people whose minds are perverted, right? <clears throat> Who think of perverse things, whose language is perverse, whose, whose lips do not honor the Lord. Stay away from that. Be light to them. Preach to them. Pray for their salvation. But don't revolve your activities around them. Because they will corrupt you, and it's inevitable you will be like them, act like them, and fall away from faith. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, and the Lord Almighty. Right? You catch it now? It's like the coronavirus. You quarantine yourself. Social distancing, stay away, right? Because you don't want to be infected. But God is saying you're exposing yourself to a worse infection, a worse virus, a worse disease, spiritual coronavirus. Because when you revolve your activities around unbelievers, where you plan your day with unbelievers and do activities with unbelievers, right? <clears throat> it is inevitable that either you're going to start acting like them and fall away from faith, or they're going to be transformed and follow Christ. But it is more likely you will succumb and be like them than they will be like you, especially when you're outnumbered by unbelievers, you're outnumbered by what they say, what they do, and you're the minority. Are you with me there? You know that saying, it says, birds of a feather flock together. That's somewhat biblical. It doesn't say it that way. Birds of a, in other words, let, let's be realistic. If you're into baseball, but I like hockey, chances are we won't be hanging out together and doing activities together 
because our interests are different. So what's going to happen is I'll find other people that like what I like. So if I like hockey, guess where my friends are? All hockey fanatics. You like baseball, you, whatever it is, you're going to gravitate to people with the same interests, right? You're going to gravitate to people that like the things you like, and then you're going to revolve your activities around those individuals, right? If I hate nightclubs, but I like going to the bowling alley, guess what? My friends will also like to go bowling, and those are the people that I'll revolve my activities around. You see the point? It's just logical. You don't need to be an Einstein to figure that out, right? It's logical. If I hate opera and I love going to a rock concert, guess what? The people I'm going to hang out with will also like going to rock concerts and won't be interested in opera. Birds of a feather flock together. So if you profess the name of Jesus Christ, how can you exist and thrive and live in a community that don't care about Jesus, but are talking about everything and anything that's contrary to Jesus and even justify doing things that are sin against the Lord, such as premarital sex, such as aborting children and a host of other, other vices that they justify and call good. They take what is evil in the sight of God and call it good or even justify transgenderism, right? Lesbianism, homosexuality. How can you as a Christian thrive in that community you can and so let me leave you with this verse first corinthians 15 first corinthians 15 33 first corinthians 15 33 why does my phone keep ringing man first corinthians 15 33 watch here May the Father sanctify my heart in the blood of Jesus and fill me with the Spirit. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Here is the biblical version of birds of a feather flock together. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Don't deceive yourself. Evil communications, bad company, immoral relationships, corrupt good manners. Did you catch it? See what it just said? Don't deceive yourself. Bad company, evil company will corrupt your good manners. It's inevitable. You may be able to resist the first time, the second time, but inevitably you will succumb and then be like them and be tainted and corrupted by them. And that has to do with relationships. Okay, sisters, and this is for the brothers too. But the reason I'm focusing on the sisters is because the sister got hit upon by some dog. May the Lord Jesus protect my sisters for his glory and my brothers. We need to strive and ask God to help us because I know it's a struggle for many of us. Lord, keep me sexually pure until I get married, if I get married. And if I don't get married, keep me pure for your glory. Okay, now, for sisters, trust me when I say it is inevitable that if you're dating a man who's not a believer, who doesn't strive to honor you for the sake of Jesus and strives to control himself for the sake of Jesus, I promise you it's inevitable you will end up fornicating and committing sexual morality because you won't be able to resist for too long. Your sinful passions will arise, and the more you feed them, the weaker you become, and you succumb, and then the relationship ends, and you allow another son of Satan to defile you and shame you in the sight of your father. You with me there? My phone keeps ringing. Is that clear? What? Man, I'm going to bust this phone. Hold on. Let me find the phone, and then we can. Oh, that's right. It's right here. Okay. Let me see what's going on. Okay. Guys, just to share some news. A dear brother in Jesus Christ, an older friend, his name is Wally. He goes to church in Chicago, Moody Church. He just gave me the news that an elder member of the Moody Church, an older brother in Christ who attends Moody Church, today he died because of the coronavirus. He was a victim of the coronavirus. But don't be sad. See, oh, no. Wait, wait, wait. That was his chariot into glory because now he's can cancer-free, disease-free, virus-free, sin-free, worry-free. He's now perfectly whole and complete and more alive because he's in the presence of Jesus Christ. Right. So anyway, with that said, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, I ask that you anoint this session and fill me with the Spirit and guide this session. 
guide the conversation by the power of the Holy Spirit and enable me to recall the scriptures perfectly, Father, not to forget any of them and interpret them perfectly. And Father, sanctify my heart to do it for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And bless everyone who heard these words, especially my sisters, your daughters, Father, that you purchased by the blood of Jesus. Give us the grace as men of God to honor them, to love them, to respect them, Father. Save us from our flesh and help us to never allow them to be dishonored by unbelievers and put a passion in their heart, Father, to seek your face, to seek the Lord Jesus and to be filled with the Spirit and keep themselves pure for the glory of Christ until and unless you bring them a man of God. If that's your will for them, bring that man sooner than later, Lord. So they can come together and glorify Jesus. But if it's your will for them to remain as they are, give them the grace to endure, all of us, Father. And Father, use these sessions for your glory. Loosen my, my tongue and save me from stammering and confusion and bless the connection. Bless us, Father. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, with fire from your spirit to be on, on fire for Jesus, in, in love with Jesus and living for Jesus. And keep us pure and save us from our flesh, Father. And bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters, Father. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Fill them with the Spirit. And have your way in Jesus' almighty name. Guys, uh, I hope that rant did not upset you. But it just happened. Like I said, my prayer every time I do a session is, Holy Spirit, you show up. Take over and guide the conversation for the glory of Jesus. All right? So that's what I want to do. Praise God, we're now exceeding the 150 minute, 50 viewer mark. Eventually, I'll get up to 900 and smoke David Wood, blow him out of the water. But now let's talk about who do we pray to. Who do we pray to? Are you ready? Because this is a question that's often asked of me. Okay? The Lord Jesus shine his face on all of you, especially these godly women. And men, you got some godly sisters here. They're single. And these godly sisters are open <clears throat> To be with the man that God has for them. So honor them. There's some of them here. You know them. Contact them. But with a Christ-like attitude, realizing that's a daughter of the king. Right? Whoever they are. Anna, Renee, uh, Hafsa, Mag These are daughters of the king. They are queens. Their father is the king of creation. I better honor them for the sake of the king. Right? So, Amen. I'm going to start Sam's, uh, what is it, Christian single? Uh, set, well, all right, chance. Single, ready to mingle. All right, everyone. Okay, let's begin. To answer the question, are you ready? To answer the question. According to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, who do we pray to? Trinitarian Christians who love the triune God, who love the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who do we pray to? All right, now, before I answer the question, I need to explain how we arrive at correct doctrine. Are you guys listening? This is important now. How do we arrive at correct doctrine? Are we ready for that? Okay. You, you arrive at correct doctrine by examining what the Bible teaches as a whole on a given subject. Now, sometimes a passage will address a specific issue clearly and explicitly and unambiguously clearly and explicit for example men should not lie down with men see that's clear right men should not lie down with men man should not lie down with an animal as would a woman clear explicit right other times the bible doesn't come out and say it black and white it doesn't come out and say it black and white but what the bible does say will lead you to a correct conclusion, a correct inference. Are you with me there? Sometimes we arrive at correct doctrines or positions regarding an issue by inference, what we call a necessary inference, that the Bible necessarily leads me to this conclusion, to this understanding, right? So there are things that are black and white, and there are things that are not mentioned explicitly or even at all, but because what the Bible teaches as a whole concerning a particular issue, you can then derive principles to come to a correct inference and conclusion about a matter, right? Everyone clear on how we arrive at correct doctrine? 
Some things are black and white. Some things are not. Like someone just said, Christos and Esti, Lord bless them. No drugs. Well, the Bible doesn't come out and say, hey, man, you shouldn't, you shouldn't snort cocaine. Because cocaine wasn't an issue at that time when the Bible was being written. So how do I know cocaine is bad? Because the Bible does say things in regards to the body and not being ensnared, not being controlled by anything other than God and his word. So that I can then make the correct inference and come to the correct conclusion. Cocaine is destructive. It's a sin against God. No, Remy. The Bible itself gives you a license to use medicine. The Bible itself endorses the use of medicine. Medicine that's produced from God's creation. Because God himself used his creation to bring about healing. Did you know that, Remy? That's in the Bible. So I can then draw the correct inference and come to the correct conclusion that God will confer healing through what we call instrumental means through medium such as the medium of water the medium of mud like when Jesus told the blind man go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam right what was the Lord using created elements using creation or when Elisha told Naman, the general of the Syrian army, go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times to cleanse yourself of your leprosy. Second Kings chapter five, right? Are you with me there? Second Kings chapter five. In fact, it says Naman, Naaman was upset because Elisha didn't even go out to meet him. He goes, I came all the way from Syria. And this is how he treats me. And his servant said, well, just do as he says. So then when he went and he dipped himself in the Jordan River, sometimes it goes, his, his skin became fresh like a baby, fresh. But what did God use? The water of Jordan, the Jordan River. Thank you, Magdalene. Lord bless you, sister, and preserve you, right? Yes, save. Even the Lord used oils. Yes, he did. I'm just giving you some references now, when you go back and read the Bible, open with them, open, read it by the power of the Holy Spirit with an open mind and see how God is using certain elements. Like he'll use mud that he spits into and puts it on a person's eyes, or he'll send them to, he does it, he uses, right? Even Paul himself said, use wine to cure your stomach. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. So it is not biblical to discourage people. From taking medicines. It is biblical to encourage people to take medicines, vaccinations, provided those vaccinations, right, are not something that will make you sin against God. The principle is as long as it doesn't violate God's word, that's okay. Now I open up another controversial topic. Please don't debate me because I know there are people say vaccinations of the, of the devil. I made a mistake. Forgive me. I don't want to get into that debate. You can use medicines. Here, 1 Timothy 5.23. Paul tells Timothy, drink wine to cure your stomach. Why wine, Paul? I just pray for his stomach. 1 Timothy 5.23. Strengthen the connection. Please, my God. Yeah, I Please, my God. Father, Son, Spirit, no buffering. In Jesus' name, no buffering. In Jesus' name, no buffering. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, no buffering, Lord. Please, Lord. It's 99% better. Okay, now do you see that? 1 Timothy 5.23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine own infirmities. Wait, Paul, why are you telling him to drink wine? Why not just lay hands on him? Right? See, Jonathan Simon, you're following the Bible. Everyone with me there? Everyone with me there? The Bible doesn't always come out and say something black and white. It says things that you draw principles from, derive inferences from, and come to correct positions, right? That's how the Bible functions. Now, why do I say that? Because people will tell me, where does it say you should pray to the Holy Spirit? Okay, are you listening now? This is where I need your attention. Follow with me. As the Holy Spirit guides me to bless you and save me from error, to glorify Jesus Christ, so Christ increases in us. As we interpret his word and obey his voice, the word being his voice, the Bible. Okay. <clears throat> Even though the Bible does not come out and say, pray to the Holy Spirit, it doesn't have to. Do you know why? Because you can draw the inference and come to the conclusion 
the Holy Spirit is worthy of prayer if he is God. In other words, let me ask you a question. I'm going to show you how to use this process of arriving at correct inferences from what the Bible teaches as a whole if there isn't a passage or more than one passage that comes out and says it black and white. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Is God worthy of all worship? Okay. Now you, I hope you're listening because you're gonna you're now in college and seminary for free. We're in the seminary of the Holy Spirit as He takes over for the glory of Christ. Okay. And part of worshiping God includes praying to Him, right? Praying to Him, right? Prayer is essential in worshiping God. Okay. Now. If God is worthy of all worship, and part of that worship includes prayer, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit is God, what's the conclusion? God is worthy of all worship. Part of your worship means praying to Him, praising Him in your prayer, thanking Him in your prayer, telling how much you love Him in prayer, and then making your needs known to Him. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is God. So what's the conclusion? If the Bible says the Holy Spirit is God, what's the conclusion then? If God is worthy of all worship, part of that worship includes prayer. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is, is God. Conclusion, the Holy Spirit is worthy of all worship, and we are to pray to him. Send the rider of the clouds to, to hell to his father. Send him out of here. You see how that works? Do you see how that works, right? So to answer the question, I'll give you biblical proof. You can pray to the Father by the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll explain what it means in Jesus' name. The reason why we invoke the name of Jesus, it means this prayer we're offering to you by the authority of Christ who makes our prayers acceptable to you. Now, let me explain it, guys. Let me explain it. When we say in Jesus' name, we're saying, Father, we pray that this will be an acceptable act of service to you because of Jesus, who gives us the authority to offer up these prayers because of his mercy, because of his righteousness, because of his blood. In other words, I'm asking that my prayer be accepted for the sake of Jesus because Jesus authorizes me and gives me the right to pray to you and makes my prayer acceptable to you. You understand what it means in the name of Jesus? That's basically what it means. This prayer I offer in the name of Jesus, meaning for the sake of your son, accept my prayer. I'm invoking the righteousness of your son. I'm invoking the blood of your son that makes my prayers acceptable to you. That's what it means. Because apart from Christ, you can't do anything that God will deem good. In other words, if you pray and you don't invoke Christ, that your prayer will be accepted to God, then your prayer is an abomination. If you fast apart from Christ, your fasting is an abomination. If you feed the poor and visit the sick and tend to the sick, if you do any of those righteous deeds apart from Christ, not in union with Christ, not for the sake of Christ, none of that will be accepted to God. Can I prove that to you? None of that will be accepted to God. Can I prove that to you now? Can I show you scripture what I just said? The fasting, the prayers, the, the charitable deeds, the sacrifices, the financial giving. None of those deeds, which are good deeds that God has commanded, will be ever acceptable to God if it's not done for the sake of Christ, in union with Christ, because of Christ. Let me prove that to you. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Thank you, Nimtet. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Watch here. Yep, I'm going to show you that, guys. Watch here. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Jehovah. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Jehovah. When the wicked sacrifice, God gets disgusted with their sacrifices. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. See, if you're righteous, he delights in your prayers. 
If you're righteous, he delights in your sacrifices. If you're righteous, he delights in your fasting. If you're righteous, he delights in your charitable deeds. But who can be righteous apart from Jesus Christ? No one. Proverbs 21, 27, as the Lord enables me to recall these passages. So guys, sit tight, listen. You're going to learn a lot about how to interpret the Bible and why we pray in the name of Jesus. Proverbs 21, 27. Watch here. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? Did you catch it? The sacrifices, the prayers, the fasting of the wicked disgust God. But wait, prayer is good. Fasting is good. Taking care of the orphan and the widow, that's good. Healing the sick, that's good. Yes, these are good. But when someone evil, dead in sin, not connected to Christ to do, do does those things, that which is good, good now becomes disgusting. Yeah, and you understand what I'm saying? These are good deeds that God has commanded. But when someone is wicked, someone is sinful, someone is not born of the Spirit, someone is not connected to Christ, when he does these acts that are good, he defiles them, makes them disgusting, makes them abominable in God's sight. It's like me taking gold and then burying it in crap. See, the gold is good and valuable, but when I bury it in crap, right, in tons of crap, who's going to go and dig into that crap to get the gold? Are you with me there? Is that making sense? Let me show you Isaiah 64, 6 to 7. Yeah, Protestant, I know. You do a lot of things, buddy. Isaiah 64, verses 6 to 7. Okay, watch here. Watch here, guys. Here, let me show you the scripture to prove what I'm saying, so I'm not making it up. Isaiah 64, verse 6 to 7. Notice what Isaiah did not say. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That should blow you away. Isaiah didn't say our wicked deeds are filthy. Our righteous deeds are filthy before God. When we do even the righteous deeds that Moses required, that's filthy in the sight of God. Did you catch it? All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, meaning call God's name to God's delight. Okay, None that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and has consumed us because of our iniquities. Did you guys catch it here? He said, we Israelites, even the righteous deeds we do are filthy racks to God. We Israelites who are steeped in sin, dead in sin, when we go to pray in the temple, it's like offering God a filthy rag. When we offer incense, or God is disgusted. It's like saying, here, God, take this filthy rag. Does that satisfy you? Does this appease you? It disgusts God. Now, let me show you how graphic the language is for my sisters here. Let me show you how graphic the language is for my sisters. The word filthy rags means a menstrual cloth. It means the cloth that a woman uses in her monthly period to wipe herself. That's how God sees your righteous deeds. Did you know that? Do you understand that's the language? It's a menstrual, menstrual cloth, the cloth that a woman uses on her period to cleanse herself, and that's what you're handing God. So can you imagine handing God that cloth that you use on your period? Here, God, does that appease you? If someone were to give you a menstrual cloth, what would you do? That's what Isaiah says about the righteous deeds of Israel. That's how disgusting the righteous deeds of the wicked are to God. Now, Write this down. We're not going to quote it. It's too long. Isaiah chapter 1. Thank you, Shemir. Verses 9 to 17. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 9 to 17. Read it on your own. We're not going to read it now. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 9 to 17. Because there, God tells Israel, even though I gave you the law of Moses, and in the law of Moses, I said, keep my Sabbaths and offer prayers and go to the temple and offer sacrifices and lift up hands and, and worship and burn incense. Stop doing it. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 9 to 17, he goes, Though I told you to do these things, I gave you these rules. Stop. I am tired of seeing hands lifted up in prayer. 
I am tired of you observing my Sabbaths. I am disgusted when you come to my altar. In the I don't want it anymore because when you come, you don't come repentant. You don't come with fear. You don't come striving to obey me. Your entire week is filled with sin, sexual immorality, lying, cheating, gossiping, slandering, murdering the innocent, shedding innocent blood. And then you come to church and offer that prayer and think you've done me a favor. Stop. I don't even want you to come. I don't want it anymore. Stop. Don't even show up in my temple anymore. See what God is saying? Thank you, Holy Tornado. You took the words out of my mouth. I was about to say something that I don't, I wouldn't find it shocking. And I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. God hasn't given me revelation, but I wouldn't find it shocking that God allowed the spread of the coronavirus to shut these churches in the West because they disgust him to his very being. They go, stop gathering. I'm disgusted with your meetings. Right? I wouldn't be surprised because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But again, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. I didn't receive a word from the Holy Spirit telling me this is the case. But I see how the Bible works. And I see God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And God operates the same way towards the righteous and the wicked. I wouldn't be surprised. He says, you know what? I'm going to remove my hand of protection. Let the virus spread like gangrene to humble you and quarantine you because I'm getting disgusted with your worship service you disgust me, and it's an abomination to me. Right? So now, now that everyone get it, if you are dead in sin, or if you are not united to Christ, and you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, your Savior, and you're not born of the Spirit, will God consider your righteous deeds, your prayers, your fasting, your charity, and be appeased by them, according to what we just read. In other words, when a Muslim prays five times a day to Allah, when a Muslim fasts an entire month, when a Muslim gives to charity, when a Muslim starts a hospital, orphanages. Now, God can use those institutions, even though they're the work of the evil, because he can use even evil people to bring about the good that he intends. But those deeds, does God accept them? Absolutely not. When an Orthodox Jew who rejects Jesus and hates Jesus and opposes Jesus prays, do you think God accepts it? Absolutely not. Because let's go to see what our Lord said in John 15, verses 4 and 5. John 15, verses 4 to 5. Okay. Watch here. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you. This is Jesus speaking. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You can't bear fruit apart from me. Meaning fruit that pleases God. Fruit that delights God. There is no fruit you can bear apart from me that God will accept. Because notice in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Luis and everyone else, you see the words of the Lord? There is nothing fruitful, delightful you can do before God apart from me. He's not saying you can't be religious. Many Jews were religious that rejected Jesus. He's not saying you can't be quote unquote spiritual. He's saying all your religious religiosity, your religiosity, all your spirituality, all your prayers, are disgusting to God. There are bad fruit, rotten fruit that God will not accept because you must do things in union with me because of me, out of love for me, and then God will accept it. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. So I hope I made the point clear. Now you know what it means why we say in Jesus' name. Father, I offer this prayer in union with Jesus. For the sake of Jesus, because Jesus, because Jesus gives me the authority to approach you boldly and offer my petitions. And because of what he did for me, he makes my prayers your delight. That's what it means. And Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Let's read it. Here, what Paul says. For 
by grace ye are, are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now let me explain what he's saying here. God has recreated you to be a holy, righteous child of God in union with Christ because of Christ, not apart from Christ. You are a new creation because of what Jesus did for you. And if you're not in Christ, you cannot be a new creation. God bless you, Sister Renee. Lord, watch over you and protect you where you're at. It's good to see you again. I just realized it's you. Long time no see. Keep praying for my daughters that the Lord will bring us together. Okay, are you with me there? You see what Ephesians 2.10 just said? No, Renee, you can't. It already, she, poor sister wanted to make it anonymous. That's how Super Chat works. But it's okay. Your reward is with the Lord. May he bless you. Poor sister. She wanted it anonymous. Okay. That's how Super Chat works. I'm sorry. If you want anonymous, you can do it on via uh, PayPal. But anyway, you understand what Paul just said? God is recreating you. He's taking you from your wickedness. He's taking you from your filthiness. He's taking you from your unregenerate, rebellious state, transforming you for the sake of Christ, because of Christ, and apart from Christ, this cannot be. In other words, God will not cause you to be born of the Spirit, made alive, in, made alive, see, I was going to say in Christ, if it's not for the sake of Christ, in union with Christ, and faith in Jesus. It's not going to happen. In other words, God's not going to make a Muslim spiritually alive and leave him a Muslim. God is not going to take an Orthodox Jew and make him spiritually alive and leave him an Orthodox Jew or a Hindu. If God is going to recreate you and save you from your wicked, sinful, unregenerate condition, he does it solely in union with Jesus Christ, not apart from him. You want me there? That's what Ephesians 2.10 says. And I'll go, I will be going deeper into that when we go back to being born again. I'm not finished with that series. I'm not finished with that series. But you understand why now we say in the name of Jesus? Because many people say, but they don't understand why. You're saying it because it is Jesus that makes your prayers acceptable to God. It is Jesus that makes your fasting acceptable to God. It is Jesus that makes your charitable deeds, feeding the, the hungry, visiting the sick, starting orphanages for orphans. All those deeds are only acceptable, delightful to God because of Jesus. Because of Je Now you see, again, it shows it's all about Jesus, right? Are you learning something from these sessions? It's all about Jesus, and it has to be about Jesus. Because there's nothing acceptable, acceptable to God apart from Jesus. It's all about him. Do you see how much the Father and the Holy Spirit loves Jesus? Do you see the Father and the Holy Spirit, how much they love Jesus? Because the Father and the Spirit saying, you better do it because of Jesus. You better do it because you trust in Jesus. You better do it because you love Jesus. Otherwise, nothing you do will be acceptable to us. Making sense? And here, Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Amen, Anna, the ultimate truth. It's all about Jesus. May the Holy Spirit fill us for Jesus. Make us love Jesus perfectly, adore Jesus perfectly, and live and die for Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit, please save us from ourselves. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, guys. Read this. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Here it is. Everything I said. Right here. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. See, we know Jesus rose physically and physically bodily, passed through the heavens, and now he's at the throne of the Father. He's there in his glorified physical body with the Father on the throne. We know this. We believe this. We have no doubt this happened. That's our confidence in our faith. So then what does it say to do? Romans 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, we don't have a high priest who doesn't sympathize with us, who could care less about our plight, who has no compassion for the pain and the misery we're going through. 
On the contrary, he feels your pain. He identifies with your pain. When you cry, he cries with you. When you hurt, he hurts with you and for you. Because you're inseparable from him once you're united to him by the Spirit. Right? But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now notice the key, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you catch it? Because you know Jesus is there on the throne of grace in heaven, in his glorified physical body as the God-man sitting at the right hand of the Father, now you can go boldly to the throne. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. The Father says, come. I welcome you. Approach me. You know why that's shocking? Thank you, Sophia Films. You know why that's shocking? You understand why that's shocking? Shocking. If you read the Old Testament, the temple, and read particularly Leviticus 16, it says that the earthly temple, guys, let me blow your mind away, earthly tabernacle, you had the holy and the most holy place, and it was separated by the curtain. The holy place, Aaron and his sons, the priests, could serve. But behind the curtain, the most holy place, you had the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. And at that time, the first temple, you had the tablets with the Ten Commandments, the laws of Moses, Aaron's rod that budded. You had a golden jar of manna, right? And the high priest was allowed to enter the most holy place only once a year with a sacrifice and then come out. Now, if he entered and God didn't accept the sacrifice, God would kill him dead. Now, that's the earthly tabernacle. The earthly tabernacle is nothing to the heavenly one. And yet the earthly tabernacle is so sacred that thy priest could only enter once a year at his own risk, hoping that this sacrifice God accept and he'd have to come out. You just read in Hebrews, you have access to the heavenly throne and you don't have to enter fearfully like the high priest. You can enter boldly in the heavenly throne because of Jesus. And you have nothing to fear. You understand the glory of the sun? The earthly tabernacle, which is nothing in comparison to the heavenly one, only the high priest could enter at his own peril once a year. Because of Jesus, the Father says, it's not the earthly tabernacle you enter. You can enter my heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly most holy, and come before my own throne boldly without afraid, and I won't strike you dead. My holiness won't consume you, but I will receive you because of the blood of Jesus. You understand? Is it making sense now what Jesus has done for you? Do you see how powerful is the blood of the Lamb? Do you see how pure and righteous Jesus must be that because of him, the Father says, all of you come to my throne in heaven. None of you be afraid if you are united to my son. Because those who are united to my son, I will never cast away. Making sense now? Is it now sinking in what Jesus has done for us and why we owe him our lives. You understand? The father says, son, because of you, they can enter my presence because they love you. If they love you, I love them. If they adore you, I adore them. In fact, I gave you for their salvation so that in you, they can dwell in my presence forever. Right? Clear? So now you guys understand why we pray in Jesus' name. Is that clear now? I gave you a thorough exposition of why. Why do I pray in Jesus' name? Why do I fast in Jesus' name? Why do I take communion in Jesus' name? Why do I feed the hungry in Jesus' name? Why do I visit the sick? In Jesus' name. Why do I build schools in Jesus' name? Why do I build orphanages in Jesus' name? Why do I give people financial help, financial aid who need it in Jesus' name? Because none of those things will be accepted by God unless I do it for the sake of Christ, in union with Christ, for my love of Jesus, and my trust in Jesus.
because he makes all of that acceptable to God. Okay. Is that clear? Amen, Pedro. Everyone got that? So we pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Now here's the question. Can we pray to the Son? Because that's the question, right? Do I pray to the Father in Jesus' name as the Holy Spirit teaches me how to pray and perfects my prayers? Can I also pray to Jesus? And what about the Holy Spirit? Yes, you can pray to all three persons of the Godhead. Now let me give you examples where people pray to Jesus. Are you ready? Let me give you examples where people pray to Jesus. Are we ready? All right. John 14, verses 13 and 14. John 14, verses 13 and 14. Watch here. Oh, my neck. Woo. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So notice what he's saying. The implication is, ask me in my name. Because if I'm asking in his name, that means I'm asking him. So when I ask in his name, Lord Jesus, by your grace, your mercy, by your authority, please do this. Jesus says, I will answer your prayers. I will answer your prayers. Ask my name, and I will answer your prayers. So here Jesus says, you can ask me in my name, I'll answer you. But then the same Jesus goes on to say in John 15, 16. I got more. I'm just setting it up. And the implication is you're asking in his name because you're asking him directly. Because he's the one who directly answers. But now let me show you John 15, 16. Let me show you it's the work of the Trinity. The work of the Trinity. If you have not chosen me, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So now hold on, Jesus. Do I ask you in your name and you'll give it to me? Or do I ask the Father in your name, he'll give it to me? And he says, all of the above. See, ask the Father in my name, he'll do it. But earlier you said, ask you in your name, you'll do it. Who's doing it? Jesus says, we're all doing it. That's why we're the Trinity. If the Father is answering your prayer, no, I'm involved in answering your prayer. No, the Holy Spirit is involved in answering your prayer. In other words, it's not one answering the other is taking it easy and, you know, kicking back. When one answers, the others answer. So if you pray to Jesus and he answers, the Father's answering with the Son and the Spirit. They're all answering together in union your prayer, in unison, in unity. So when my Father does it, no, I'm doing it. No, the Spirit is doing it. Right? You getting that? John 16, 23. Amen. Salvation is only in Christ Jesus. John 16, 23. But I'm going to show you more explicit passages. More explicit passages. Okay? That show they're praying to Jesus. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I send to you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So wait, Jesus. We ask the Father in your name, he'll do it? Yes. But then earlier you said, ask in your name, you'll do it. Yes. So are you doing it or the Father? He says, why is it either or? It's both and. Him and I together. When the Father answers, I answer, and the Holy Spirit answers. In fact, it's the Holy Spirit who will move you to ask the Father in my name or ask me directly. Because the Holy Spirit is the one sent to teach you how to pray and make your prayers acceptable. And that too is my gift. Because of me, I send you the Spirit to teach you how to pray, when to pray, and perfect your prayers in my sight. It's a triune work. It's the work of the Trinity. That's why we are Trinitarians. Now, Acts 7, 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. And they, they stoned Stephen... And notice what it says, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Whoa. When Stephen is about to die, see, when you face death, the first one that comes to your mind when you're about to die is your creator and life giver. At your deathbed, 
You cry out to the creator of your soul, your life giver, your God. Notice Stephen, when he's about to die, he calls out to Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then notice what he goes on to say. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Did you catch what Stephen did? He cried out to the one who owns his life, who gives him life, who's his creator. And who was that? Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I come to you. Take my spirit, Lord. I'm your first martyr. The first Christian killed because I love you. And with honor, I die for your glory. Take me, Lord Jesus. Receive my life, my spirit into your presence. And Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And he died. Now, here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. Stephen prays to Jesus the same way the psalmist prays to Jehovah. Stephen prays to Jesus the same way the psalmist prays to Jehovah. Go to Psalm 31, verse 5. But I'm going to connect that with, with Saul in a minute. Christos and Esli, I'm going to connect it. I'm going to connect it in a minute. Watch here. Yes, have to look. Psalm 31, verse 5. Psalm 31, verse 5. Okay, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Jehovah, God of truth. Wait, wait, wait. Into your hand I commit my spirit, Jehovah. But Stephen, who's a Jew, says, into your hands I commit my spirit, Lord Jesus. Why is Stephen praying to Jesus the way the psalmist prays to Jehovah God? Did you catch it? Why is Stephen, a monotheistic Jew... Praying to Jesus the way the psalmist just prayed to Jehovah God. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, brother. And do you see proof that you can pray to Jesus? Because that's what they did. They did pray to Jesus. Right? And so remember what Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now here's the problem, folks. According to the Old Testament... Your spirit goes back to God who gave it. That's why they would pray to God. God, my spirit that animates my body, I entrust to you. My spirit that animates my physical body, I entrust into your hands because it comes from you and it returns to you, right? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Watch. Yes, God bless you, Tim Thompson. Yeah. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So Stephen's body returned to dust, but a spirit went back to God who gave it. But hold on. The God who gave it is Jesus because he entrusted it to Jesus. The Old Testament says your body returns to the dust when your spirit leaves, and your spirit goes back to God who gave it. Stephen's body returned to dust, and a spirit went back to the God who gave it. But the God who gave it is Jesus because he says, Lord Jesus Receive my spirit. Stephen, are you saying that Jesus is the God who gave you your life, your spirit to animate your body? And so because he gave you your spirit, that spirit returns to him? Yes, exactly. But that can't be if Jesus isn't Jehovah God. And he's telling you, who told you he's not Jehovah God? Sink in? Now I want you to catch something here. Let's go to Acts 7. Let's read. 57 to 60 one more time because I'm going to show you something here. Acts 7, 57 to 60. Okay. Yep, thank you. Salvation is only in Christ Jesus. Watch here. It is Daryl Danzinger, even though I try to explain it away. Watch here. Acts 7, 57 to 60. Watch what happens. I want you to notice who's there. Who's there? Observing this, who's there, amening the murder of Stephen. Then they cried out with a loud voice. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now notice Acts 8, verse 1. 
Remember what Proverbs 15, 8 said. Let's go to Acts 8, verse 1. Luisa, I hope you're still with me and listening. Acts 8, verse 1. Acts 8, verse 1. Watch this. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, guys, who was there? Saul, whom we know as Paul. Who was amening the murder of Stephen? Saul, whom we know as Paul. Acts 15, verse 8. I want you to look at this verse one more time. One more time. Because now I'm going to connect it. Some of you should already know this because I've discussed this in the past. But Proverbs 15, verse 8. Saul is there, amening the murder of Stephen because of his love for Jesus. And then Stephen says, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. In other words, forgive them. Okay? But Proverbs 15, verse 8. Watch this. <clears throat> Are you guys still there? Because it looks like I lost people. I hope you're still there. Okay. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Did you catch it? If you are righteous, God delights in your prayer. If you're righteous, God is pleased to hear your prayers. If you're righteous, God hears your prayers, right? Right? That's what Proverbs 15 verse 8 said. Now, if Jesus honored Stephen's prayer and he forgave them, what does it look like? To be forgiven. In other words, if Stephen says, Lord, forgive them, what does Christian forgiveness look like? Doesn't it look like they would come to faith? Because the only way the Lord will forgive someone is if he turns to Christ, right? There is no forgiveness if you don't turn to Christ. So how does the Lord forgive? Bringing you to him to trust in him, right? Is it a coincidence that when Stephen prayed, the Lord converted Saul in answer to his prayers. Bam! Why do you think Luke is mentioning Saul? He's trying to show you Saul was there, and through Stephen's prayers, Jesus saved Saul. Bam! Showing how much he loved and honored his servant. You caught it? Here Jesus showed you I delight in the prayer of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, my saint on earth, a holy slave for my glory. Of course, Stephen, your prayer is my delight. It's the delight of my father, the light of the spirit, because it's the spirit that filled you to pray. Therefore, I answer your prayer, and I will take that man Saul, and I'll forgive him because of your prayer and transform him to replace you. This shows that the prayers of the saints are powerful. And God will take into account the prayers of his people to bring about his will. Now notice I just said, yep, Stephen mediated for Saul. And it was his prayer that the Lord heard to bring about Saul's salvation. So folks, what do you learn from Stephen? Do not underestimate the prayers of the saints who are the delight of the heart of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and bringing about salvation and healing and restoration. Do not underestimate that. Are you with me there? And if you read Acts 6 verses 1 to 8 and Acts 7, this is the description of Stephen. It says he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit and grace. And when he saw his fa face, it looked like an angel. And if you read Acts 7, from memory, he recounts the entire Old Testament from memory. In other words, he was like Saul, mighty in scriptures, bold as a lion. No wonder Saul <clears throat> became his replacement, because Saul was like Stephen, mighty in the Old Testament, filled with boldness and passion, like Stephen. And notice I said his prayer was won by the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who filled him and showed him how to pray. How do I know that? Acts 7, 55. Acts 7, verse 55. Are you seeing it? 
Thank you, Jonathan Simon. You put it beautifully. One spirit, spiritual giant left and another took his place. Acts 7, 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly. See, he was full of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit was filling him. He was soaked in the living waters in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Ghost. He looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, I want to just comment on what Jonathan said. One spiritual giant was taken and another was raised in his place. That's what I've been saying for years. Jesus doesn't need me, doesn't need Stephen. Because in every age, Jesus raises up warriors for his glory. When he calls one home, he's replaced them with another, if not dozens. Right? Right? Just like the church continued to grow even after Stephen died because Jesus is the God of the church and he's almighty to preserve the church and raise up warriors for the church to do his battle by his power in the spirit. Stephen went, Paul came, the Lord does it till this day. So if, if the Lord says, Sam, time for you to come home, it is not your loss. Because Jesus, who's faithful, will raise up ten thousands of soldiers that will put me to shame. It's all about him. Right? So, did you see that they prayed to Jesus? They prayed to Jesus. Now, let me show you again other examples of praying to Jesus, but we got to connect with the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis 21:33. Genesis 21:33. Genesis 21:33. Watch here. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord Jehovah, the everlasting God. So calling on the name of Jehovah, that's worship, that's prayer. Because in the Old Testament, you call on Jehovah's name to praise him, to thank him, to laud him, and also to make your request known to him. Thank you, Sophia. God bless you, right? Are you with me there? Calling on the name of Jehovah, that's worship. That's what Muslim calls dua, dua, invocation. We cry out to Jehovah and we cry out his praises. We love you. We praise you. You are God. You are holy. You're almighty. You are perfect. And we also cry out to him for our needs. Lord, sustain us. Lord, keep us in love with you. Lord, purify us. Lord, feed us. Lord, clothe us. Right? That's what calling on the name of Jehovah means, right? Everyone got it? What does calling on the name of Jehovah mean? It means to praise him, to thank him, to acknowledge him, to talk to him, and to ask him for your needs. Okay, now let's go to Psalm 99, 5 to 7. Yeah, that's an altar where they offered sacrifices, Holy Tornado. An altar where they offered sacrifices to God because that was required. Psalm 99, 5 to 7. A lot of meat in this session, but we're losing people. We're up to 180. They're going, hey, man, come on, man. Don't go. So, man, we're just beginning, suckers. Psalm 99, 5 to 7. <clears throat> Exalt ye Jehovah our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon Jehovah the Lord and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them. So did you catch it? Called upon his name to worship him and to invoke him for their needs. And he answered. Louisa, you've been following me so far. Is it blessing you? And you're learning who to pray to? So did you see this act of calling upon is an act of worship? It's prayer where you thank God, you praise God. You love God, speak to God, and make your needs known to him so he can answer. Now, how does this time with Jesus? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. So I'm going to answer this question finally. Who do we pray to? The Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. I'll give you a few more. We'll wrap things up. And I got to start another session on how Muhammad proved Jesus is God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. And this is in the Jehovah's Witness Bible too. Read this. 
unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Notice, even you being set apart from the world has to be done in relation to Christ. Did you catch it? You're only set apart from the world, set apart from Satan, set, set apart from sin in relationship to Christ. God does not set you apart from your sin, from Satan, from the world, unless it's in relationship to Christ. See, everything is Jesus. I was set apart from Satan and his influence and from my sinfulness because of Jesus, for Jesus, in union with Jesus. It's all about Jesus, man. Wow. And you're called to be saints. Only in Jesus can you be a saint. Only because of Jesus will you be a saint. Only. Only. Now notice what the second part says. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Wait, 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 wait. Post that again, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. One more time. Notice the second part. Watch this again. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that... In every place, call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Wait, 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 wait. Paul, you a Jew, persecuting the church, amening the death of Stephen. And Gentiles who used to worship Zeus and Hermes and Diana. All of you are now calling on the name of Jesus Christ. But Paul, you know, in light of the Old Testament, calling on the name of Jesus means that you are praying to Jesus. You are speaking to Jesus. You are thanking Jesus. You are praising Jesus for who he is and what he's done and asking him for your needs and requests. Paul, what are you doing? Worshiping and praying to Jesus. Sinking in? Everyone getting it? Now... Paul recounts, uh, we're going to have to catch this in mid-context. We're going to catch this in mid-context, okay? Paul is recounting his conversion, how Jesus appeared to him, and he saw Jesus, and then Ananias came and laid hands on him, right? So he could receive his sight, and he got baptized. Now, we're going to pick it up in that midpoint. Guys, pick it up in the midpoint. Paul is going to recount his conversion, where Jesus appeared in glorious light, knocked him down, blinded him, and then Ananias came, laid hands on him, received the sight, and baptized him. So it's about Jesus, right? Because I want you to see what Jesus does for Paul. And Acts 22, 16 to 21. Acts 22, 16 to 21. Send Hoof back to the universe, to the black hole that he and his mother came out of. Okay? Acts 22, 16 to 21. Guys, read. Please read. He's talking about Ananias came. Ananias was sent by Jesus. And Ananias told me this. Watch. And now, why tarryest thou? And Ananias is telling Saul, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul is saying, and Ananias told me, go and get baptized in water and call on the name of Jesus to be saved. Now, I did that. So I did that. Now, notice what Paul says. Guys, notice this. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, guys, he's in the temple. The house of worship for Jehovah. He's praying in the temple. But guess who shows up and answers him? As I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Paul, they're not going to accept your testimony about me. Who's me? Jesus. And I said, Lord, they know that I'm prison and beat in every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was, I also was standing by and consenting unto this. And he said unto me, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Okay, now, guys, what is Jesus doing? Answering Paul's prayer in the temple when Paul is praying as an act of worship. In the temple, the house created for the worship of God, prayers to God. Paul prays in the temple. Jesus shows up, and Jesus speaks to him and answers his prayers and tells him what to do. What is Jesus doing answering the prayer of Paul? 
What is Jesus doing showing up to Paul when he's worshiping Jehovah in Jehovah's temple? Can you explain that to me? Paul is praying in the temple. The temple is the house of worship of Jehovah, the house of praying to Jehovah. He's praying in the temple, which is the house to worship Jehovah, and Jesus answers his prayer and shows up. What's Why is he answering his prayer? You guys are getting it or no? Because Jesus is the Jehovah God that he's praying to. He's praying to Jesus, and Jesus is appearing and answering him. That's why. Okay. Couple more and we'll be done. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Here you got to pay attention again. We're almost done. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. What time does Haterwood go live? What time does he go live? Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. All right. Yeah. You guys want me to do another session then? What's this topic going to be? Okay, let's read. 12, 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that were given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now I want you to pay attention here. I want you to pay attention here. All right? For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Let's post 8 to 10 again. 8 to 10. Sorry, because there was too many texts. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. Okay, watch here. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. We'll skip 7. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So I asked the Lord three times. Notice he's asking the Lord. Lord, remove this thorn in my side from this angel of Satan. Save me from this torment, Lord. So three times he's asking the Lord. So the Lord answers. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches in necessities in persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, guys, if you didn't pay attention, you're going to miss it. He said three times I asked the Lord, Lord, I can't handle this torment from Satan. This thorn, please remove it from me. The Lord answered me, my grace is enough for you. Because when you're weak, that's when you'll see my power perfected. So then he says, all right, if that's the case, then I will rejoice in my infirmity so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Did you guys catch it? The Lord that he prayed to told him, my grace and enduring this is enough. Because when you are tormented, then you can see my power displayed in your life. He goes, all right, then I boast that the power of Christ rests on me. Notice, the Lord who's answering him, the Lord he's praying to, the, Lord's who, the Lord whose power is preserving him is the power of Christ, meaning he just prayed to Jesus. He just prayed to Jesus as Lord. He's saying, Lord Jesus, please remove this from me. And Jesus answered, said, no. I'm going to allow you to struggle with this infirmity so to teach you to trust in my power, not in your own strength. So again, why is Paul praying to Jesus? Because Jesus is God. But I want you to learn something from Paul's example. Can I now apply it to you, to you guys? I want you to learn something from Paul's example. What you learn from Paul's example is not every infirmity in your life will be removed because at times God is bringing infirmities in your life to teach you to be humble, to teach you to cling to him, to teach you to depend on him and to remind you, you are nothing without me. If something like the coronavirus can handicap the world, do you see how powerless you are without me? If the virus could shut down the world's economy. Do you understand you are absolutely nothing without me? You understand? If an invisible enemy can shut down the world and make 
human beings act like animals, untamed, uncontrolled animals. Then why do you boast and think highly of yourself when you're absolutely nothing without me? So that's what Jesus is telling Paul. Paul, this infirmity was for your own good. Why, Lord? Because you're getting puffed up. You are starting to think of yourself better than you are, not realizing you are what you are because of my grace. You are what you are because of my favor. You are what you are because of my blessing. And without me, you are nothing, Paul. So this is going to teach you. Be humble. Realize you are nothing, less than nothing without me. And I am everything for you and to you. Trust in me. So as a side issue, what do you learn from here? You learn that calamities may be God's design for your life to teach you to trust in him, to teach you to rest in him, to teach you to be content because no calamity, no virus, no disease, no trial will ever consume you and destroy you and sever you from Christ. Impossible if you are in union with Christ. Right? Impossible. Are you with me there? Impossible. Nothing in creation can sever you from Christ. So that's what you're supposed to learn here. A few more examples. We'll wrap it up. A few more examples. We'll wrap it up. Of people praying to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, another form of prayer is called benediction. Another form of prayer is called benediction. You guys know what a benediction is? A benediction is what you usually find in a church where you have the elders, the bishops, or the pastors invoking God for blessings on, on the church, right? And you usually have a benediction at the end, but you'll also have prayers at the beginning, right? You see that, okay. Benediction is also a form of worship. It's a form of prayer. Because in a benediction, an invocation, you're invoking God to bestow his blessings upon the believers that are gathered, right? The believers that are gathered, right? That's what you're doing. When the bishops or the pastors begin, they'll invoke God to bless the congregation. And they'll end it with an invocation of benediction. Now, let me show you the repeated benedictions, invocations that the apostles employ to the recipients of their letters. See, people don't even realize that Paul, as well as the other writers of the New Testament, will start their letter by invoking a blessing on the recipients and end the letter by invoking the blessing on the recipients. But people don't catch this. If you were to pay attention to this, then you would see, you would see that the inspired authors of the New Testament begin their letters with a prayer to the Godhead and end their letters with a prayer to the Godhead. Father, Son, and in one place, even the Holy Spirit. Let me show you what I mean. 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. These invocations at the start and end of letters are a form of worship, form of prayer that we miss and we don't pay attention to. Here, for 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, notice. Grace be with you. See, that's a prayer. You're praying God's favor. Favor be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. That's a prayer. He just prayed to the Father and the Son to bestow their grace, their mercy, and peace on the recipients of the letter. That's a prayer, folks. Did you know that? John is invoking Father and Son to bestow their spiritual blessing upon the church that receives and reads this letter. Right in front of your eyes, you've been reading prayers to Jesus without realizing it. Many of you do realize it. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Watch here. Grace be unto you, favor be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, what are you doing? And here's my challenge to every one of you. 
quote a single place in the Old Testament where believers invoke God and a creature to bestow his spiritual riches upon the people of God. Show me anywhere where they invoke God and a creature, whether a human prophet or a created angel like Gabriel, to bestow the blessings of God upon the people of God. You won't find it. But all throughout the New Testament, they're invoking God the Father, Jesus Christ. God the Father, Jesus Christ. God the Father, Jesus Christ. Why? Why are they doing that? 1 Corinthians 16, 22 to 23. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 to 23. Some guy, I'm going to get there. It's not an Orthodox liturgy. It's a biblical verse that you've adopted. It's part of the liturgy. I'll get there. Just watch. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 to 23. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maran athe. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Two shocking things. He ends the letter with an invocation to Jesus alone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So he's praying, Lord, bestow your grace upon all of them. Wow, Paul. You just single out Jesus for this prayer, this benedic benediction? Yes. Why would you pray to Jesus in heaven to bestow his grace to believers on earth? Because Jesus is God. So I can ask him to do it. But when he does it, the Father does it with him and the Spirit does it. So it's not just Jesus who does it. The Father with the Son, in union with the Spirit, bestow the spiritual blessings on the people of God. But I want you to catch verse 22 again. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Anathemi means may God damn you if you don't love Jesus. May you be damned to hell if you don't love Jesus. Pedro Jr. But let me explain what Maranatha is. That word Maranatha is not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word. It's a word from my mother tongue, Pedro. You see how serious it is? Paul says, if you don't love Jesus from your heart, may God damn you. May you be damned if you don't love Jesus from your heart. Okay, but now, watch the word Maranathe. Let me explain that. Maranathe is not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic, a Syriac word, adopted into Greek. Maranathe is two words. Maran, tha, or... Yeah, Maran, athe. Some will say it's Marana, Tha, or Maran, Athe. It's two words. Maran is Aramaic for Lord or Our Lord. Athe is Aramaic for come. It's an Aramaic expression meaning Lord come, Our Lord comes. Everyone with me there? It's an Aramaic word. And Sai Christian and other Assyrians, we still use that word today. You have Assyrians who will say Maran, Athe. Maran, Athe. Right? Even those of you who speak Assyrian, those who speak Assyrian, we still use that phrase. We'll say Maran Ate or Maran Ate. There are actually Assyrians who even use that word, Ate. So it's an Aramaic word. But here, here's the question, though. Here's the question. Here's the question. These are Greek speakers. They read, write Greek, and speak Greek. Why are they using an Aramaic word in their worship? As they invoke Jesus to come. This is a prayer. What you're saying is, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, return. Lord, we wait for you. Come. They're asking Jesus to come. Lord, come. Lord, return. Why are they praying to Jesus, their Lord, to come in Aramaic? Luis and everyone else. Why are they praying in Aramaic and saying, Lord, return. Lord, come. Lord Jesus, come. We want you to come. See, and Anna Groin gave you the Greek. Erhu kiri. That's the Greek. Erhu kiri. Okay. You know why? Because this practice of praying and asking Jesus to come started among the Jews who spoke Aramaic. In other words, this is proof that the Jews in Jerusalem... Jesus' Jewish followers started praying to Jesus immediately in their mother tongue, a practice adopted by the Gentiles. So here you have proof that Jews in Jerusalem were already praying to Jesus and worshiping him in their mother tongue of Aramaic. No, it not might be some guy. It is. That's why it's Aramaic. 
It's all right, Andrew. Andrew, I'm going to block you. You know that, right? If you want to go to David, go. I'm going to block you, bro. Sit down and relax, baby. You like David, go ahead. White, racist, Australian pig you. But anyway, are you with me here? Everyone understand the implication? The Greeks are adopting a word used by the Jews in their mother tongue of Aramaic in praising Jesus. So now here's my question. Why are monotheistic Jews, why are monotheistic Jews in Jerusalem praying to Jesus and saying, Lord, our Lord Jesus, come, return? Why would they do that? What would make monotheistic Jews steep in the Old Testament to pray to a Jewish man in heaven saying, our Lord, come. What would make them pray to him? Because these Jews, Peter, James, John, Thomas, came to soon realize this Jew, Jesus, is not a man. He's God who became flesh, the God-man, the God of Abraham, worthy of praise. And by the way, you English speakers, you've also... Employ words that are not English, not Greek, not Latin. How many of you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. How many of you say hallelujah? We're almost done. Do you know hallelujah is not an English word? It's not a Greek word. It's Hebrew. Why are you using a Hebrew word? Do you know why? Because you worship the God of the Hebrews. And the Old Testament is in Hebrew. So we've adopted words from the Hebrew Old Testament in our worship of God. Even when we say amen, 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 like Christo said, that too is from Hebrew. So as you see, the language of the Jews have shaped our worship because God singled out Israel to be his covenant people and wrote the scriptures in their language. So from them, we've adopted words in our language that we use to worship God Words that are originally Hebrew or Aramaic. Did you catch it? Now, finally, finally, let me show you a Trinitarian prayer showing that you can pray to the Holy Spirit and you should pray to the Holy Spirit and you should worship the Holy Spirit and love the Holy Spirit and adore the Holy Spirit because he's God with the Father and the Son. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Yeah, but he used it in a different context, but he's all using amen, Pedro, because of his mother tongue, right? Amen means truly. It is as I say. Have no doubt. It's completely true. Here's your Trinitarian prayer, folks. Here's your Trinitarian prayer. Guys, listen. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. See, he ends the prayer with an amen. Here is a prayer to all three persons of the Godhead. Lord Jesus, shine your grace upon the church. God, fill your church with love for one another and you. And Holy Spirit, do your work in producing fellowship among us and with God. Amen. Paul, why are you praying to the Holy Spirit? Why are you invoking the Holy Spirit with Jesus and God? And Paul, how dare you start your prayer by mentioning Jesus ahead of God the Father? Did you catch it? Did you see the prayer? He starts with Jesus, then the Father, then the Spirit. How dare you, Paul, mention Jesus ahead of God the Father if Jesus is a creature? That would be blasphemy. It's like me saying, right? May the grace of the Archangel Michael, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of Gabriel be with you all. Do you know why he could put Jesus ahead of the Father? Because Paul realizes Jesus is no creature. Jesus is God Almighty, equal in essence to the Father, equal in dignity, glory, and honor, and praise, so is the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter the order you start with. I can start with Jesus and then speak to the Father and with the Holy Spirit. I can start speaking to the Holy Spirit, then move to Jesus and end with the Father. It doesn't matter as long as you ask the Holy Spirit to guide your prayer, teach you how to pray. You can start with the Father and with the Spirit. Start with the Spirit and with the Son. It doesn't matter. The order, because all three are God and worthy of all praise and worship and love. Right? Now, guys, 
Even though I said I'm going to do a second session, I'm not. I do want you to go to David Wood's channel and learn why Muhammad is a false prophet. All right? So praise God. The timing is good. Lord willing, I'll try to do two sessions tomorrow. I was a little late today again. If I had done it earlier, we do it. It's okay. Tomorrow, we'll do another session, how Muhammad proves Jesus is God. And I'm going to be talking about prayer, God willing, Lord Jesus willing. So go to David's channel and advertise my website, my YouTube channel. Tell them, come. Right? It's okay. Tomorrow, God willing, let's do it between 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time. So it'll be earlier and I have enough time to do two sessions. I was late because I went to pick up this book. I was late because I went to pick up this book. Bart Ehrman's new book, because he thinks he's a theolo theologian, just came out today. Heaven and Hell, A History of the Afterlife. Bart Ehrman, who's not a New Testament scholar or theologian, is now writing books on the theology of the New Testament. Can you believe it? So I decided to pick it up. So I can see what to use against him and our behalf and how to expose him for the glory of the triune God. Came out today. So keep praying for the ministry. Keep praying for the support. Keep praying for my daughters that God will abundantly provide for them and for me and through me for them to do this work. Pray for their health and my health and pray for our holiness. As long as Jesus provides for the ministry, as long as he gives me the health and the holiness, I will keep teaching you until Jesus calls me home. But pray, Jesus brings my daughters to me sooner than later. I have not seen them since June, and it's hard. Pray, Jesus convicts their mother to fear the Lord and repent. Remove Martin from their lives and bring them to their father so I can be there for them, especially in light of this crisis. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah, the eternal son of the father who became flesh to the glory of God the father. Amen, Lord Jesus. Modern Athe, Lord, come sooner than later and seal us by your spirit. And fill us with your love and keep us together forever in love with you. We thank you, Father, Son, Spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tomorrow, God willing.